Hello, my name is Dr. Tammy Giovanelli, and I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about earthquakes. So what you're looking at on the screen is a world seismic map. Um, and from previous lectures, the outline of the red dots that represent earthquakes should now make sense to you. So you should be seeing the outline of the modern day plate tectonic diagram that we previously studied. So you can see a concentration of earthquakes if we're focusing on the North American plate first. You can see that concentration of earthquakes out west, and that makes sense because there's a convergent plate boundary and there's a transform uh, fault called the San Andreas Fault that goes through there. Um, following to the Pacific plate, you notice that there's something called the Pacific Rim of Fire that we've talked about, and that is a highly concentrated area of earthquakes also because the Pacific Ocean is entirely a convergent plate boundary. Um, then if we look in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you'll notice a string of earthquakes and that highlights the mid-ocean ridge, um, which is a divergent plate boundary. And so you can follow that mid-ocean ridge all the way uh, along the bottom of the seafloor. So that's considered to be the world's longest mountain chain at about 37,000 miles. So that's your, your trivia answer for today. Uh, if you move over towards uh, Africa and uh, Eurasia, what you'll notice is the east to west trending earthquake band. And of course, there's a convergent plate boundary there uh, to create the Himalayan mountains. So as India is moving to the north, but remember from our, our plate tectonic videos uh, that Africa is also moving towards the north. And so you see a density of, of earthquakes there. So what's fantastic is that the, the very first seismogram, a seismogram is something that measures the energy of earthquake systems that was invented about 1901. Um, and so we had an understanding of the concentration of earthquakes very early, right, at the turn of the 19th century. But it wasn't until 1966 when the theory of plate tectonics was solidified that we truly understood why the earthquakes were in those positions. So it took more than 50 years to establish the mechanism for earthquakes. If we move closer to home, we can look at the seismicity of the United States, this map representing 1990 to about 2018. And again, we can look at, at the density because we can look at those individual dots as they represent earthquake systems. Um, but the other interesting thing is we can look at them in terms of depth. And we're going to explain that a little bit more throughout this lecture, but the idea that either they're happening at some depth within the earth. So this, the red here on this diagram represents a depth of 800 kilometers below the surface, zero representing the surface. So what we're gonna learn is that the depth of the earthquake is going to translate in its intensity. When we look at this map too, because we have an understanding of plate tectonics, and we know that our west coast is both a convergent and transform boundary, we can see the concentrations of those earthquake systems in California. And so even if we were to look up at the United States Geological Survey earthquake uh, research site today, I'm sure we would find several low energy earthquakes in California. So consistently they have magnitude two and three earthquakes being released. So low levels of of energy. And, and that's positive because you don't want to store that energy. When you store that energy, that's when you end up in, in bigger events. Uh, looking at this map too, you'll notice that there's some earthquakes on our east coast and you'll see a concentration uh, there in what we would call the, the Midwest of the, of the United States. And we call that area the New Madrid Seismic Zone. So this area here um, here's Georgia, right? So we've got Georgia and we've got Tennessee, we've got Kentucky, and then right here in this red band represents the new Madrid seismic zone. So this natural, national seismic hazard map is highlighting the areas of our country that have the highest density and highest risk of seismic energy. So on the west coast is red, and that makes sense, right? Because we have to identify those boundaries. Um, the area in the center is called the New Madrid Seismic Zone, and what that is is an ancient or paleo. Paleo means ancient 
fault system that has been buried over time. So it's a system that's no longer active, but there's a series of fractures and faults. And as the ground settles, you can release magnitude three, four, maybe even sometimes five energy earthquakes. But it's not a new, or we wouldn't call it an active fault boundary, but it is something that just goes through subsidence, kind of like a house, like a house over time might go through subsidence. You might see cracks as it is, um, as it is being leveled amongst the ground that it sits on. So same idea. Uh, fun fact, there's a little bit of a hot spot over there in South Carolina. So you might've visited some of the hot springs. Uh, and also we're familiar if we look out west by Idaho, because there is something called the Yellowstone Super Volcano and also of course, Yellowstone Geyser. So those are generated by a hot spot. So you have a body of magma that's moving its way towards the surface. And as that body of magma moves to the surface, it is going to fracture what's above it, right? So it's taking up space. So you're gonna end up with fracturing. Um, and as that happens, you end up with seismic release too. Uh, Hawaii, uh, Alaska is another uh, interesting place. So you can see uh, this quarter section of Alaska and Alaska, remember, is on a convergent plate boundary, ocean to ocean convergent plate boundary, and that produces the Aleutian Islands, um, which are volcanically active. A uh, major eruption of Aleutian Islands happened in 1964, and it produced our, a tsunami wave that hit, um, that hit, of course, Canada, but it hit Washington, Oregon, and also Northern California. And we'll talk a little bit about that in upcoming episodes. And there is the earthquake map of the Aleutian Islands. So um, as promised, you see a distinct band along the ocean to ocean convergent zone. We can look at um, some of the biggest and baddest earthquakes over time to make comparison. So we can think about the very first one is the highest energy ever recorded. So we, we've we talked a little bit about recurrence intervals and, um, and magnitudes of events. So we said like the largest magnitude on an event is recorded as one. So when we look at this data, the largest magnitude of event is going to be at the top and it's going to be the 1960 event for, that happened along Chile, and it has a magnitude of 9.5. Um, magnitude, when we talk in terms of earthquake, has to do with energy. And so we not only say that this is the, the, the earthquake that has the largest uh, stored energy, um, but it has a recurrence interval that is not as frequent, right? So following that, as I mentioned, the 1964 Alaska event had a magnitude of 9.2 followed by one that I know very well. Um, this is the December 26, 2004 event that happened in Indonesia. So when this uh, earthquake event happened, I was just finishing up my PhD. And uh, if you remember, I was studying tsunamis. So um, I got a call on December 26 from my advisor saying, guess what? There's a, a massive and major earthquake event and there is a massive tsunami wave also and, and devastating. Um, so, so what we're, we're establishing here is that there was a large event in 1960, 1964, and then the next largest event was happening in 2004. And as we go down the list, there Kanchaka, Alaska, um, Tibet, Indonesia, and, and we see Kanchaka again there at the bottom. So, um, if we're going to look at these, identify these on our plate tectonic map, then what we would recognize is that the biggest and baddest earthquake events are happening along those convergent plate boundaries. So we're starting to see a trend here. From previous lectures, you now have an understanding of how there's a relationship between stress and strain. So you've seen this diagram then when we talked about structural geology and structural geology has to do with not only how the layers of the earth are organized, but how they behave under these two different properties. And what we said is that if there's low amounts of stress and strain, 
you can have elastic behavior. So you're you're adding small amounts, low levels of stress and strain to a rock, but it's, it doesn't happen. So it rebounds to be the same exact size and shape. But once you reach the elastic limit, once you cross that threshold, then your rocks are gonna behave plastically. And within structural geology, we learned about anticlines and synclines. So rocks that are gonna be folded in or they're gonna, yeah, the, the rocks are gonna be folded in, in either an anticline or a syncline formation. And then once that plastic behavior is exceeded, you end up at brittle failure. And that's when you end up with either a normal fault, a transform fault, or a reverse fault. So when we're talking about earthquakes, then we are really thinking in terms of the brittle failure that happens. So we're thinking of high stress and high strain we are no longer behaving plastically, and then we exceed and we're in brittle failure. So there's going to be movement. And in addition to that movement, there's gonna be energy that is released. Oh dear, my slides just moved. Hang on. So again, relating to the stress and strain diagram, I want to introduce something that's called the elastic rebound theory. Um, also called the ERT. By definition, the ERT involves the sudden release of stored strain in rocks, which causes movement along a fault. So we'll take a look at this diagram. So uh, number one here, we're looking at uh, the original position of a fence. And we're saying that that fence is cross cut by a fault. So the rock is acting with stresses on it. So we're looking at the the stress and strain diagram here, and we're saying low amounts of stress and strain are acting on it. And so it's initially acting at, uh, with elastic behavior. And then eventually what will happen is as that stress has caused strain in the rock, we've exceeded the elastic limit. And so now we start to see the land acting as plastic behavior. And so in this part two diagram here, remember that the fence was straight and now the front, the, the fence is being offset. Um, additionally, when we talk about the elastic rebound theory, we're honing in on transform plate boundaries. So you remember that a transform plate boundary is where you have lateral movement. So you're imagining that the stress and strain is being applied in a lateral position. And so that's why you see the offset of the fence in this diagram. And then after you exceed the elastic limit and your rocks are no longer behaving plastically, then you're gonna see a, a sudden rupture. Uh, number three, rocks under high stress and high strain will break suddenly. So you see this, this quick and sudden snap um, of ground. And so I wanted to show you a few pictures that represent this. I think it's pretty cool. So um, we, <laughs> in California, especially a lot of these pictures have been taken. Uh, you can imagine a, a train track, yes? So your train track is straight and then you add low levels of stress and strain a little bit at a time. Eventually that railroad track will bend um, plastically. So it hasn't hit the point yet of brittle failure because it hasn't completely snapped. Um, but you can see people out there surveying it, um, trying to make some predictions as to when brittle failure will occur. Not that you can prevent brittle failure from occurring, but maybe you can make some predictions. And certainly um, for any train passengers, this is a, a pretty big hazard. So the, somebody will have to come along and in, in some way fix this railroad track to make it, um, to make it useful again. Here's another example of, you're looking at like rows of, of corn or, or some type of, of crock, crop, and you're imagining that those lines were together and then all of a sudden they had been disjointed. So there's movement on the ground surface to cause some displacement. Here we 
too. And in this uh, picture here, you're seeing, you're, you're imagining like looking down on a map view of, of rocks. And so again, you're imagining these two land masses were together and now they have been disjointed. And, and so brittle failure has occurred in, the, in this diagram here based on the lateral movement. Um, just imagine the great distance that this reflects. So you see a, um, a big displacement that is represented by more than probably 10 miles. So you can get drastic changes in the land surface as a, as a result. Uh, here's a, another where you're looking at the disjoining of a river system. So you have like a canal and then you have a, a, a major river system. So we're talking about big landscape changes that can occur. But the good news is that because you're going through the stress and strain diagram, um, it's low levels of, there are low levels of, of stress and strain that adds up over time. So again, geologists can make some predictions or some, at least some recommendations um, to help mitigate these situations that could be quite dangerous. So the questions you might have is about the specifics about earthquakes, right? So we're considering seismic waves, a focus, and epicenter. And I want to define what these are for you. So a seismic wave then by our definition are those waves, energy waves that are produced by an earthquake. So seismic waves behaves like any other wave that you can think of. So um, when we think of uh, a wave system, we talk about the wave height and we talk about the wave amplitude. And so that's how we characterize a wave or we, we measure a wave. And when you have the seismic release of this energy, it comes from a location called the focus. And the focus is at some depth where the earthquake is going to originate. So remember we, on the first diagrams, we talked about depth to, the, to where the earthquake originates. The depth is to the focus. So if you have a shallower depth earthquake, you're more likely to see damage on the ground surface. Um, and even if it's a lesser intensity, if it, even if it has less energy, it can be more destructive in some instances. So for a geologist, we're really interested in knowing how deep the earthquake was. And that's one of the very first questions that we ask and look to solve with the seismometer. Um, now, what is usually often reported in the news is something called the epicenter of an earthquake. And so you have the focus and then right above the focus is the, called the epicenter. And so um, in California, they would say uh, the epicenter is San Francisco. And so that's just the ground surface, usually labeled by a city that's above the focus. So it's just a little bit more easy to communicate the epicenter um, than for, for uh, citizens than talking about the focus. So, this is a really good diagram because it shows you how the energy is dispersed from an earthquake event. Um, and so, anytime that there is a, a movement along the fault, you are going to have energy that radiates out. And so, you're going to end up with these patterns of energy. So then the closer you are to the earthquake, the more that you're gonna be able to feel the earthquake. Um, if you're ever in an earthquake, there is a website called the United States Geological Survey and it's called the Earthquake Research Center. You click on that and it has a link where you can report what you felt. So I was just in Costa Rica and there was a earthquake and the building for sure moved. We were on the third floor of the building. And so I quickly got on because I'm a citizen and I went to the USGS and reported what I felt. So they are looking for physical descriptions of, of what you felt. And they just use it as a check and balance against their seismographs. But it's pretty fun to be part of that process as a citizen. Okay, so when we talk about the energy leaving the focus of the earthquake, we categorize them in three major parts. So the first one is 
we like to talk about primary waves or P waves. So primary waves are the first to arrive at the recording station. So the first to, they're the first thing to show up at the seismograph and they can pass easily through a variety of different types of mediums. Um, this little schematic here is showing you the, uh, the earthquake where it, where it started at the ground surface and it's showing you that it can go through all different parts of the earth. So you will remember that you have the inner core, the outer core, the mantle, and then the crust. And so what this is suggesting is that if there is an earthquake, those waves travel and they radiate out and they can radiate through all parts of our earth. So it can travel through a solid, a liquid, and, um, and a plastic state. Remembering that the inner core is a solid, the outer core is liquid, and then the mantle is plastic and the crust is, is solid. So primary waves can, can pass through all those different types of mediums. And that's important because if you're interested in locating an earthquake, you have to have three seismograph stations. So it's a process that's called triangulation. So you have to have the, you have to have the report from three different stations and then you correlate them on top of each other to find out where the epicenter of the earthquake was. Okay, so we said that P waves can travel through all different types of mediums. And what this diagram here is suggesting is that maybe there is an earthquake at the, at the North Pole. Um, the earthquake showed up, there's a, a, a large magnitude event that happened and it's showing you how the waves move away from that energy. So there's a slight, it's called a P wave shadow zone. We won't mention it too much in Geology 101, but just kind of recognize that if, if, you're, um, if you have a seismic station in either of these P wave shadow zones, it's not gonna record the data. And that's just the way the, the waves are reflecting off of the, the outer core. There's the, the mechanics of it. The, the geophysical properties of it makes it refract. So there's uh, there's these small spaces where if you're at a recording station, you're not going to be able to receive the data. But the good news is that there's this global seismic network now. So the P wave seismic zone is less of an issue because you would just correlate to something that wasn't in those areas. Um, next, we would can talk about S waves, and these are called secondary waves and they can only pass through solid rock. So, um, so again, considering the components of our earth, our earth is differentiated into parts. So you have the inner core, that's solid, the outer core, the mantle, and then you have the crust. So when we talk about S waves, these are only gonna pass through the, the outer crust because they're not gonna be able to pass through the plastic mantle. And so now you end up with a much greater S wave shadow zone. So again, just to review, so you have your seismograph station, there's been an earthquake, your seismograph is going to record a P wave, and then it's going to report an S wave. And S waves always have greater amplitude than the P wave, so you can distinguish them on a seismograph, which I'll show you in this lecture. So if we make a comparison between, between P waves and S waves, then we can look at, at this diagram. On the right, it represents depth in kilometers. And then on the X axis, it represents velocity. So depth on the X axis and velocity is on, fake news, velocity is on the X axis and depth is on the Y axis. So you're essentially imagining um, a cross section of the earth. So you've got crust and then you have the mantle and then you have the outer core and then the inner core. And this diagram is showing you the difference in how P waves versus S waves travel. So S waves cannot go through the plastic mantle or the outer core, but they can go through the inner core because it's solid and then waves can go through all different types of mediums, a solid and a liquid and a plastic, 
and the velocity is going to be a little bit different when it goes through those things. So you're going to have a, um, an increase in velocity as it's going through something that's plastic, and then when it goes through something liquid, it's going to start to slow down, and then it gets even slower when it goes through something solid. So the velocities are different, and the moral of the story is that P waves can go through any type of medium, S waves cannot. And that's a big way that we differentiate the planet, honestly. That's one way that we know that the Earth is separated into parts uh, is from using seismic waves to tell us that. We talked about P waves, primary waves, we talked about S waves, they're secondary waves, and then we can look to something called body waves or surface waves. And surface waves are the, the ground shaking and the, where the true destruction happens. So body waves usually have great amplitude at the surface. Um, body waves do not show up uh, on a seismograph, however. So when you're looking at the screen, you're seeing the recordings of a P wave. So your P wave is first, and then I told you that S waves have a greater amplitude. And so you're making a comparison between the P wave and the S waves. And if I were to ask you, um, which of these seismograph stations is closest to the earthquake, you would probably say the third one, and that would be correct. And you would say the third one because the primary waves show up quickly, but the, also the amplitude of the S wave is higher. So you're likely closer to where that energy has initially been released. This diagram shows it a little bit more clear. So it's showing you the first arrow is going to be your, your P wave, and then it's showing you where your S wave is showing up. And this is your S wave because that's when they become higher in amplitude, but also closer together. This little diagram is just describing surface waves for you a little bit more. By definition, seismic waves that travel on Earth's surface away from the epicenter, slowest motion of waves. So they're the slowest, but they make the most damage. And one of the things you'll be doing in laboratory is trying to make some predictions using seismograph material. And so I just kind of want to introduce you to this concept on the screen. Uh, what they're showing you is a P wave, and they're showing you an S wave. And we need this information to correlate it um, to something that's called the Richter scale. And when we do this, it's important to measure the distance, and here they're measuring the distance in seconds. So seconds is on the uh, x-axis, and distance in millimeter is on the right. And they're measuring the distance between the arrival time of the S wave minus the P wave. So they're saying that the S wave shows up 36 seconds after the P wave on the seismograph. So once you have that information, you can correlate it to a Richter scale. So I'm going to go back once more and take a look at the seismograph. So we said S minus P is 36 seconds, and then we have to know the amplitude of the largest wave. So again, on the right, it's recorded in millimeters. So up here at the top, I would say that we're going to we're going to round up for for fun. We're going to say that the amplitude of the wave is 200 millimeters. So we've got a distance of 36 seconds and we've got an amplitude of 200 millimeters. So if we wanted to look up that specific event, we use something that's called a Richter scale. And the Richter scale is reported in the unit of magnitude. And the magnitude is based on a logarithmic scale. So it is based on the idea of having a seismograph. So the seismograph was invented to report the magnitude of an event. And so when we look at the two components that we need, we can get them both out of seismogram. So we said 36 seconds and we said the amplitude of 200, which is off the, the charts of 
this particular diagram here, but we could figure that out, right? We could figure out the, the energy of that event. Here, they're using an amplitude of 23 millimeters and they're using a, an S minus P of 24 seconds. So they are um, they're coming up here to 24 seconds and then they know the amplitude to be 23 millimeters. And when you cross that with the Richter scale, that means that using this data, your magnitude is five. And that's a significant earthquake. The other thing we need to mention when we talk about the Richter scale is that, again, this is logarithmic. So when you have a magnitude two earthquake, it's 10 times larger than a one. When you have a magnitude three earthquake, it's 100 times larger than a one. So the growing distance between these uh, events is quite large. So talking, relating that again back to recurrence interval, the more frequent your event happens, the, the less energy it has. So again, low-lying magnitude earthquakes happen all the time. California all the time has magnitude two earthquakes. So they're releasing, releasing, releasing energy. Usually in the world, there may be only two magnitude eight earthquakes reported per year. So you might only get two magnitude eight earthquakes and that's it per year. And that's because they're huge events. And, the, and you, when you see them on the news, they're usually reported because there's usually death and destruction that goes along with it. Um, so here we're looking at three different places, Fresno, Las Vegas, let's go there, that'd be a lot of fun, and Phoenix. And so if you wanted to know if there was an earthquake event and you wanted to know the magnitude of it, you'd have to have those three stations and overlap them to figure out the data. It's called triangulation. So defining the Richter scale and using the seismometer to understand energy is very good and it's very useful. And so most TV reporters are gonna report on the magnitude of the event. Geologists, however, are usually more interested in understanding um, what has happened after the fact by looking at the ground surface. So as you know now, there's a difference between um, normal faults and reverse faults. So for sure you could look for that displacement or you could look for the lateral displacement. So either displacement of the hanging wall or the lateral displacement, if we're talking in terms of maybe the San Andreas fault, that it's a transform fault. So based on our equation here, this represents a seismic moment where the seismic moment is equal to the shear stress that's estimated, the area of the fault rupture, and then the average displacement along the fault. So um, we don't have to worry about this too much in Geology 101, but sometimes this will also be reported in the newspaper. So they might talk about the magnitude of the event, but sometimes they might also report it in terms of seismic moment. And so in this case, you would know that the bigger the seismic moment, that means the bigger the displacement had occurred. So we, we just looked at some pictures of the elastic rebound theory that showed some small displacement of crops, some bigger displacement of a railroad track, and then some big displacement of river systems. So we could ground truth that, go out and take those measurements, and then make some predictions about the energy released. And in addition to the Richter scale, there's something that's called the Mercalli Intensity Scale. And this is compiled by uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And by no means do you have to memorize this or even write this down, I just want to make you aware of this so that you too can be a citizen scientist. Um, and what the mortality intensity scale does is it monitors the effects of the earthquake as it varies in proximity to the epicenter. And so when I went to the USGS website to report the earthquake in Costa Rica, these are the questions that they were asking, asking me to comment on. So this correlates from low energy to high energy. So Roman numeral one, 
people do not feel any earth movement. So there might've been an event that the Richter, that the seismograph picked up, but it's not felt. Uh, level two, a few people might notice. Level three, many people indoors feel the movement because the objects will move. Uh, four, dishes and doors rattle. Earthquake feels like a heavy truck hitting the wall. That. <laughs> uh, level five, everyone feels movement and people are, aw are awakened. Like, whoa, what just happened? Uh, level six, people have trouble walking. Pictures uh, fall off the walls. And level seven, loose bricks fall from buildings. Um, so there are ways to correlate the Mercality intensity scale to the Richter scale. But this is um, what insurance adjusters go out and do at first, is they, they survey people and they ask them what happened. And, and it's used by the insurance adjusters because they want to know if, if it's a level four, dishes and doors are rattling, then probably things are going to break. And um, I posted a video for you to, to watch and take a look of that deals. And, and now that you know the Mercalli intensity scale, you'll be able to identify um, these different situations. So you'll be able to recognize, oh my gosh, the building's falling down. It is a Mercalli intensity scale of seven. Uh, last major earthquake in North America was in October 17th of 1989, and uh, it was uh, truly a devastating event. It was a magnitude 7.1. It was called the Loma Prieta uh, earthquake. There was a, a baseball game going on at the time. It destroyed uh, major bridges going across Oakland, Oakland Bay. A lot of lives were lost. Uh, the good news was that after this, a lot of legislation passed in California to mitigate against earthquakes, meaning that they increased their standards of building. And so now like bridges have to have, um, uh, you know, a percentage of being able to have mobility and move before they break. And certainly there's a limitation on how tall the buildings can be. Here is the comparison chart. So you've got Richter magnitude on the left, a description, the Mercality intensity scale, and then you have the annual expected number. So again, as I mentioned, the higher the intensity, the lower the recurrence interval. And so those earthquakes that are 8.0 or higher are likely to only occur one or two within a year versus um, versus a Richter magnitude of 2.0, where you can see more than 600,000 recorded. In addition to natural earthquake events, the United States has also experienced human-induced earthquake events. And I put this in the lecture mostly for my environmental science people, but because you are all citizen scientists, it's good to know that um, that earthquake uh, intensity and number has increased in areas where there is fracking going on. So fracking is when you drill a well um, in an area that has natural gas. And so natural gas is sometimes trapped in a, uh, a unit of rock called shale. And so what happens is you drill a well and you put this patented substance down the well that has some viscosity to it and it breaks the the rock and it allows for the gases to release out of the rock so that's a process that's called fracking and it uses a whole lot of water in order to to do that and this nasty substance that goes down the well and what happens then when you're fracturing the rock that fracturing of rock is translating into earthquakes and they can be a magnitude of three or um, so, so maybe sometimes around five, usually they're less than three. But um, here is a statement by the USGS, the number of earthquakes has increased dramatically over the past few years within the central and eastern United States. Nearly 450 earthquakes, magnitude 3.0 or larger occur in the, occurred in the four years from uh, 2013 to 2017, over 
100 per year on average compared with an average rate of 20 earthquakes that was observed from 1970 to 2000. So a lot of data is coming in to show that fracking is causing earthquakes, which is just something to consider um, if that is worth it or not. And I, I put this little diagram up here just um, in case you want to zoom in and it gives you a little bit more information about how the, the fracking process is done. If you're interested, I'm happy to, to talk more about that with you as I've done quite a bit of research here um, in North Georgia regarding the possibility of fracking and whether it is good or bad. So I will leave you there. You've been a wonderful audience. If you feel an earthquake, report it. Take care.